Amen. Well, we're talking about something and just want to continue this series, Generation to Generation, and just something God's put on my heart and something that uh, we're going to share. We call it Gen to Gen, and uh, it's found out of the Psalms 145. We just kind of took that passage. We'll read that together, Psalms 145, verse 4. So if you have your Bible, turn there, your device, click on uh, Psalms 145, verse 4, Generation to Generation. I want to just share a little bit. Uh, do a little recap. I'm not big on review, but I want to do a little bit of it and then just go into what God wants to say today. In Psalms 145 verse 4, it says, one generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. Amen. And we really felt like the Lord is uh, specifically and really directly speaking to our church. Amen. That it's time to really uh, act like and be a generational church. Amen. That we do want to reach every generation. How many know it's not just about reaching this generation, even the next generation, but many, many, many generations. How many know the blessing of the Lord doesn't stop at one generation, doesn't stop at three or five generations? The Bible says that it goes on to a thousand generations and even beyond that. Amen. And so we're excited about, amen, that. And so we have that part to play. But it's very important that as a church, we understand that we, we can just, we can uh, get to a place where we think we're actually doing what God wants us to do in the earth, and now really you just find yourself being a spectator of what God's doing in the earth. Amen. If you're not really understanding His biblical pattern and and uh, the way that God has um, His order for church, how many know Jesus is building the church? That's what He said, right? So today I want to share uh, a little bit more of this. Let's just recap. We talked about the importance of a generational church, but we talked about making the connection. Uh, and there's three things that make the connection, keep the church moving, and building a generational church. And we just talked a little bit about it. And we talked about making that connection. And that connection is God's covenant to each generation. That's God's connection. I mean, how many know we got to make that connection? I mean, that blessing that the Lord has for each generation. So we had to, we talked about how uh, it's important how we see the perpetual promise of God for each generation, how that we need to see the generational strengths. Uh, and differences and strengths, and then we need to fill in gaps and tear down walls. And it was important that we talked about we build a generational relationships. Amen. And then uh, today I'm just going to focus on uh, the, really the second part of that is that is keep the church moving. Keeping the church moving. Amen. So let's turn to Psalms chapter 78. I'm going to read out of uh, verses 2 through 4, Psalms 78. I'm reading out of the NIV, by the way. In Psalm 78, Verses 2 and 4. I'm going to read scripture, talk, and then we'll pray um, and really share what, what I feel like the Lord has for us today. Um, in Psalm 78, uh, this is a, a really an awesome, the whole chapter really is amazing, but he, he talks about this. He says, I will open my mouth, in verse 2, I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from old. Now, he's also talking about Jesus. This is a messianic prophecy about Jesus. Remember, Jesus said that I have to teach in parables. This is how I teach the word. Uh, sometimes I teach in parables, so he's speaking about Jesus. Verse 3, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. Verse 4, we will not hide from them, from their descendants. We will tell the next generation the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. Amen. Let me know it's important that we go from generation to generation. We pass on the things of the Lord, the blessing of the Lord. That's what so uh, powerful about evangelism is that we're telling other people about Jesus Christ. From Amen. From what happened way back. Amen. And how God in the very beginning created man and how that man fell. But yet God had a plan all through the centuries to bring man back to himself. How many know that's the story of the gospel, isn't it? But you know, we're telling people, amen, the story of the generational blessing that's in the Lord. Amen. And we're not just passing down information to our children and the next generation. I think that's important, but it's not just information. It's not just stories that we need to pass down. But according to the Bible, it's the covenant that we pass down. It's the legacy of Jesus and the faith in God that we pass down. How many believe that? So it's not just information and stories that we're passing on to the next generation, but it's this legacy, it's this faith, it's this covenant that we have in the Lord. Amen. I mean, you know, as a, as a person, you can grow up in church and you can have a wonderful memory. You can memorize scripture. You can, you can hear all kinds of scriptures and teachings and, and sermons. But how many know that's, that doesn't get you into heaven? Amen. It's the covenant that God has made with you. When you come into that covenant with God, you realize, wow, I'm part of a bigger picture here. I'm part of something 
greater than myself. And so I believe that God's blessing goes from generation to generation. How many believe that? Amen. And really what it is, what I want to bring down today is really walking in the purposes of God together and building a strong generational church. That's really what it's about. It's really about the generations coming together, but I have to throw this little uh, disclaimer, if you will, out before we get teaching, and that is, first of all, is that it's not about making the generations the same, that we dress the same, we talk the same, we, we come on, how many know that's impossible? Amen? I mean, if, now, if you're a young person and you want to dress like your grandparents, good luck with that, right? But come on, we're not making all the generations the same, because you can't do that, right? That's not where the blessing lies. Did you know that? Not all everybody being the same. That's not what it's all about. But what it is, is it's that, uh, you know, that we can all come together from in one generation to another generation and experience the blessing of the Lord together, walk in the covenant together. And the second thing is, is that I want to just throw out that it's not about depending on the ministry of the church, amen, to, to raise up another generation. That burden comes on the entire body of Christ. Uh-oh. Amen. Thank God for the children's ministry. Thank God for the youth ministry. Thank God for the young adults ministry, the college age and career age ministry. Thank God for those things. But it's up to the church to raise up the next generation. Amen. And we all share that together. So a lot of people, when I'm talking about these things, are going to be like, oh, well, we have a youth ministry. We can do that. And that's your job, pastor. And that's Michael Nashley's job. And and that's, and you know, no. How many know that's all of us, amen, come together to raise up the next generation? Unfortunately, what I see today is I see really the uh, older generation, I've seen this, and it's kind of sad, but I've seen the older generation express this to the ch- in the church that we don't need the younger generation. So I- I've seen that, unfortunately. And so what they do is they isolate the age groups, and, and, and when you get old enough and big enough and God anoints you enough, then you can join our group over here. You know, but until then, you listen to your music, do your thing, go your way, and then eventually you need to step up and, and take the baton. How many know that doesn't work? And I've seen that, but I've also seen the younger generation say, I don't need the older generation. We don't need the older generation. And so what they do is they leave the church, and a lot of times they even leave the faith, and we don't need that. We can do our own thing, and we don't want that music. We don't want this. And how many know that's not good, right? And so as a result of it, what happens is what we're really saying is the older generation is saying that we don't want the future. And what the younger generation is saying is we don't like the past. But how many know you've got to have both together? The Bible says that a wise man brings out of his treasure both old and new. Amen. God uses the old and the new. Come on. God uses the older and the younger together. That's my message together today is that we need to build a generational church. See, the big biblical pattern is that we need each other. How many young people need older people? And everybody's like, oh yeah, I've seen some really unintelligent young people. They need me, right? But how many know the older generation needs the younger generation? You've got to have the younger generation. Come on, somebody, especially in the church. And so we're preserving the covenant and we're stepping into the future at the same time Amen. Generation to generation. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your word today. Thank you that word brings life. It brings focus and direction. But it also speaks to us as the church, as globally as a whole, as the church, where we need to be, what we need to be doing, and the direction that you're taking us in our day, in our generation. We pray, Lord, that we'll continue to walk in a generational blessing today. Thank you, Lord, for for all the things that you've done in the past. We look so forward to the future, but we're not going to get lost today. We're going to rejoice today because you're doing something new, fresh, and exciting. Amen today. Lord, we just embrace it all. We give you the praise and the glory in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. And so the importance of moving forward as the church. The church has to keep moving forward. The church has got to keep moving in the direction of God. Amen. Any church that stops moving will, 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 will die. Any church that stops reproducing will die. How many know anybody, any family name? You know, it, if, if you don't keep reproducing of that name, that name will die off, right? And, and it's the same in the church. It's, we have to keep moving forward. What does that mean? That means that we're staying current with the Lord. We're being in, in, keeping in step with the Lord. How many know you don't always have to keep in step with the culture, but you can be in step with God? How many know sometimes God is doing something that's totally opposite of what's happening in the culture? 
And there's other times God is doing something that's almost similar, but of course in a different way than the culture. Come on, somebody. I may know that. And so what we've got to know is we've got to stay with the Lord and stay in tune with the Lord. Amen. Because there's sometimes God's going to take us some direction that's complete opposite of what's happening in, the, in our culture today, right? And there's other times that God's going to be speaking and say, look, you've got you to step up. You've got to, with me, you've got to keep in step with me, right? And we're afraid and all that. But God gives us the strength because he wants us to keep moving forward in the Lord as a church. Amen. And so moving forward is not just being busy. How I many you know that uh, we, we should never mistake activity for achievement, right? There's a lot of people who are spinning their wheels thinking they're going somewhere, but they're just spinning their wheels in place, right? How I many you know movement doesn't mean forward motion, amen? Just because you've got things going on doesn't mean you're really doing anything important, right? And so as a church, we want to make sure that we're not just spinning our wheels and we're stuck and we're just kind of in that rut and we think we're busy, we think we're doing something for the Lord, but we're really not in step with the Lord. We're not moving forward with the Lord. Amen. How many know we see this in the church in the wilderness? How many know the writer of uh, New Testament, Paul in, in Hebrews says this, he says that the church in the wilderness, he refers to that 40-year uh, journey in the wilderness and that group of people as the church in the wilderness. How many have ever read that? Come on, let me see your hand. You've read that, right? How many know that? Okay, well, you learned something new today. All right, great. So the church in the wilderness, that's what the Bible says. But you know, the Bible also d declares that God was not happy with those people. That God, for 40 years, put up with their stubbornness, put up with their complaining. I mean, he had it up to here, and he said, finally, you're not even going into the promised land. After 40 years, I've blessed you, I've had grace and mercy on you, I've protected you, and you still complain. How many know that's a church in the wilderness did not want to move forward? They constantly wanted to go back to Egypt, constantly complaining complaining about you know where they were and what Moses was doing and and all and what God was doing. How many know that's not a good place to be? So the church in the wilderness didn't want to move forward. Okay? Look into the new covenant in the, the book of Acts, the church of the new covenant, right? The church in the book of Acts. You couldn't stop them from growing. I mean, you couldn't keep them from growing, right? I mean, the Bible says that on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 people were saved. About a month later, 5,000 people were saved. A couple months later, 12,000 people were saved. I mean, it was amazing, right? You couldn't keep these people from growing. So what was the difference between the church in the wilderness who didn't want to move forward and the church in the New Testament and the book of Acts who kept growing? What was the difference? It's the heart of the people. Oh, yeah, it had everything to do with obeying God, and, and they were rejoicing because the new promise that God was giving, and they were, they were excited about the new covenant that was going on. Yeah, it was all those things, but ultimately it was the heart of the people. It was the heart of people that there's people that wanted to go back and be stuck and stop moving and not move forward and complain and criticize and be stubborn in their heart. Or there's a group of people that were so passionate about what Jesus did and who he is and the call of God in their generation, the power of God. Come on. It's the heart of the people. And so as a church, we've got to make sure that our heart, amen, is right before the Lord, that we've got to embrace what God is doing in our day. Anybody? And we, that we create a culture in our church or an atmosphere in our church, amen, a, 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 a kind of that, that, I guess a culture you could say that, where, amen, we're, we want to be a generational church. Whether it's old or new, young, it doesn't matter. We're, we're just embracing what God is doing. Anybody? And that's, that's, that's the mark of a generational church. Because a church that wants to get stuck and not move forward, you know what's going to happen? They're going to look around one day and realize, wow, it's the same handful of people that have been together for 80 years, and we don't have anybody under the age of 60. And so the only promise they have is selling the building. Right? Giving to another organization, a charity or whatever. That's, so you know what they do? They bring in a younger pastor. We got to do something. Okay, and, let, and let's bring in, you know, clown ministry and a puppet ministry. Brother, if you're bringing in clowns, you lost already. All right. Sorry. Anyways, you know, and so we got to do something. We got to go back to the young. We got to get, right? Is that what they do? Why? Because they didn't make the transition when God was speaking. They didn't keep in step with the Lord. They didn't keep reaching out. They didn't keep multiplying. They didn't keep transitioning every age group. Amen. How many know God has a plan for you to bear fruit in your old age? I don't care if you're 99 years old. God has a ministry for you. God has a call on your... Come on, the things of the Lord are still alive. I don't care if you're five years old. The call of God is on your life. Amen. God has a call for you. God's got a, a mission for you. Come on, somebody. 
We get it. But we've got to keep moving and keeping in step with the Lord. Amen. And the church as a whole has got to keep moving forward. Amen. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be like the church in the wilderness. I want to be like the church in the book of Acts. I want to keep growing and multiplying and impacting uh, our city and our community and nations. I mean, that's, that's just my heart. Amen? Right? And so that's what we want to do. And so what it is is this continual building and maintaining of strength and health in the church. That's so important, isn't it? And we do that by three things that I want to share with you today. Number one is sowing. Number two, growing. And number three, going. I love that. I just, it's easy for me to remember that. Amen? But how many know that's important, isn't it? So it's sowing, growing, and going together. That's the key. It's together. It's together. I'm going to show you that today. Number one, sowing. I believe it's so important that as a church, the way that we keep moving forward and keep moving and keeping in step with the Lord is sowing. How many know you reap what you sow? You reap what you sow. I, you can't get away from that, can you? You can't ever get away from that principle. But how many know that principle can work for us in a mighty way? You reap what you sow, right? And how many know it's not just about hosting? I'm not talking about just doing a youth event or just having some type of youth movement in the earth. I'm talking about raising up generations who fear the Lord and are running after God. Amen. And then how does that happen? That has to happen with a plan. You've got to do that intentionally. You can't just say, oh, just because we've got a lively praise and worship, we've got a, a good preaching ministry, we've got this, this, this program, this. Oh, then our church is just going to keep growing. How many know it doesn't happen that way? You've got to have people that are intentional about reaching the next generation, raising up generations after generations after generations because you reap what you sow. Sowing into this generation. Amen. How many know the easiest way we can sow into this generation is witness and preach the gospel? That's one of the simplest ways that the Bible says that we can actually sow into this generation. Amen. And we can put in the seed of the word. How many know if you sow the seed of the word, guess what you're going to reap? You're going to reap the word of God. Amen. Right? That's what Jesus taught us. Amen. And so reaping what we sow. Amen. We reap, we reap what we sow. And, you know, some people have high expectations of a great, mighty harvest without sowing one seed. How I many know it doesn't happen that way? Amen? I mean, it just doesn't happen that way. You don't get a huge harvest uh, of corn by not, and, not, and not put one, uh, you know, seed of corn in the ground. I mean, you know, and there's a lot of churches, they think, well, we're just going to get this great harvest, but they don't sow into the community, they don't feed the poor, they don't do this, they don't reach the lost, they don't do any of that stuff, and how many know, so after so many years, you're living off that harvest, you're, oh yeah, that's great, but there's no seed going back in, and so years later, you'll have no crop, you'll have nothing, no harvest of young people, young leaders, come on. Young families, amen, so we want to reap what we sow. We want to sow the good seed, right? And how many know that there are seeds of culture and there are seeds of covenant? Well, we've got to pay attention to this. And, you know, one of the things I've realized and is that Jesus taught that the devil is busy sowing seeds, isn't he? Oh, he's busy sowing seeds. He said one night when, the, when all, the, all the workers were sleeping, the enemy came in and he sowed seeds, bad seeds, seeds and terrible seeds, and he ruined the whole crop for them. Amen. And Jesus said, that person is like the devil, and he's going to sow tares. How do we know it's going to, and the Bible says the wheat and the tare are going to grow together, the angel of the Lord is going to harvest it, and then God's going to separate it. Right? I don't know about you, but I don't want that kind of uh, harvest. I want a harvest of pure righteous seed in the earth. I want godly kids and godly people, people that really committed to Jesus, real converts of the Lord, amen? That's the kind of seed we want to see. That's the kind of harvest we want. We don't want people that, well, I believe in God and I also believe in this and that and I also believe in that and everything. We want people that believe in Jesus Christ as the son of the living God, amen? That's a good seed, isn't it? Well, you got to sow something to get that harvest. So as a church, River Valley Mission, what we, or River Valley Church, what we've got to do is have that mission, amen, of sowing the right seed in our community, in our, in our city where God's planted us. If we don't sow in this generation, if we don't sow, guess what? We're not going to reap anything. One day that building over on Catherine Street could be empty because nobody's doing anything about it. Come on, somebody. Hello. The Bible says about Joshua that there arose a generation after Joshua that knew not the Lord. Why? Because the, the parents weren't busy sowing the right seed in their generation. Amen. Come on. Amen. All right. 
So we need to move on. But, you know, one of the things that concerns me about this principle, and I need to move forward, is, is what concerns me about this is the question that I ask myself a lot and think about, is the devil more successful at reaching young people than the church? I mean, you've got to ask yourself that question. Are his plans and schemes working more than the church's strategy, than the church's events, the church's plans to reach the lost? Amen. The Bible says that the devil is busy uh, reaping a harvest, sowing seed and reaping a harvest. I don't know about you, but I want the, the youth group in our church to be bigger than the youth group, the MTV youth group, or the, or the you know, whatever, the secular youth group, or the, this youth group. Come on, I want this generation of, of believers to be bigger, amen, the harvest to be bigger than what the devil's got, amen. Amen? Come on, he's sowing seeds of depression in this generation, and anxiety, and perversion, and guess what? If the church doesn't do its job, he's going to reap a harvest. I don't know about you, but I want the devil to reap a harvest before the church does. Amen. That's why the Bible says we've got to get busy, thrust in the sickle, and reap a harvest. Amen. We need to move on. What, one of the principles I want to just bring out real quickly is we need to reap and sow together. That's what the Bible says. Why? Because the principles of reaping and sowing affects many generations. Did you know that? And, and some of you are here as a result of somebody in your past in your generation, that sowed a seed of alcoholism. Right? They sowed that seed in your family. That seed of abuse. That seed of neglect. That seed of defiance, rebellion towards God, perversion. There was a seed that was sown. And some of you have lived that life and, and you and kind of lived that out. And that was your result. That harvest in your life is a result of somebody that in your past sowed a seed of that. Someone in your family that sowed that seed. How many know what I'm talking about? Amen. Right? And so we have to understand. So it affects many generations. That's why sowing the right seed in our families and fathers teaching your kids, moms teaching their kids what's right and wrong. Amen. Come on. You're going to reap a harvest if you don't give up. If you're faithful as a parent to sow those seeds, amen, you can trust the Lord that, amen, He's going to water those seeds and there's going to be a harvest of those seeds. Amen. But we've got to do our job, don't we? Amen. Sowing and reaping together. Jesus taught this in John 4, 35 and 38. I'm going to read this quickly. I've got to hurry. Do you think the work of harvesting will not begin until the summer months and four months from now? Look around you. Vast fields of human souls are ripening all around us and are ready now for reaping. The reapers will be paid good wages and will be gathering eternal souls into the granaries of heaven. What joys await the sower and the reaper both together for it is true that one sows and someone else reaps yes that's true but he said this i sent you to reap where you didn't sow and others did the work and you received the harvest amen so guess what it's important that we realize that you may never see a harvest of of souls in your family or in your community but you've got to be faithful to sow the seed amen you may never see that harvest but you've got to be faithful to sow the seed aren't you glad for that come on that's what it's about Say, Lord, Lord, I'm going to be faithful to sow the seed of the gospel in this city. Now, I may never see a whole lot. I may never see anybody saved. But you promise that if I sow that seed, I will reap a harvest or we will reap a harvest. Amen? But here's what I like. The sowers and the reapers rejoice together. That's what it's about in the church. We need to rejoice together. When young people bring other young people into the church and they get saved, all of us need to rejoice. When an older person brings an older person in the church and, don't, and they get saved, young people need to rejoice. Amen. We all need to rejoice because we're all working together. That's the whole point is we're all working together. How many believe that? So we're, amen, we're going together, growing together. Amen. Number two is growing together. And that's the thing about one of the things I realize about what I'm seeing in our day and generation. And even as a minister, I look around and, and I realize that some churches uh, are a mile wide but an inch deep. And I don't want that about our church. I mean, that's just my heart. I, Lord, I don't want to be a mile wide. You got this program, you got this, this, and this, and this, and this, but we're an inch deep. In other words, there's not, whole, not, not a whole lot of depth to our leader team, to our serving, to the next generation. Amen. We're not deep. Come on. 
we're shallow. Amen. And when it's all said and done, when I'm gone, when, when, when all this is, is gone, amen, 60, 70, 100 years from now, amen, then there's nothing. But the point is, is that if we do our job right in our generation, 100 years from now, there's going to be a remnant still coming from the seeds that we sown in this place. Come on. Amen. Anybody? And that's our heart is that we want to grow as a church. See, because expansion is good. But if we don't connect the generations, we'll weaken the church. It actually weakens the church if you don't connect the generations. And in that connection of generations, there's strength and there's an addition to the capabilities and opportunities the church has to reach this generation. See, if you don't reach the next generation and you leave room for the youth group and the younger people and young adults and, and, and the leaders to come up, what happens is that you actually cause a hurt to come to the church and it weakens the church. It doesn't make it stronger. It weakens the church. And so I don't know about you, but I want a strong church. And so we want to grow together. Let me go through this quickly in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 29. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 29 says this, The glory of young men is their strength. And all the young men said, Amen. And the attractiveness or the beauty of an old man is their gray hair. All the guys with gray hair say Amen. Right? That's the attra- so what is he talking about? So the glory of young men is their strength. The beauty of old men is their gray head. That's amazing. You should rejoice in that. Instead of singing, let it go, let it go, you just need to say, let it show, let it show, right? What is that? That's strength and wisdom. That's strength and wisdom he's talking about. The glory of young men and the old men together. That's strength and that's wisdom. That's what he's talking about. And so many times, uh, we've talked about this before, a, a lot of times in a lot of cultures that plow or use ox or back in the day used to use it, a lot of times what they do is they would put, not all the time, but many times they would put an older ox with a younger ox. And that younger ox would be the strength, but that older ox would be the wisdom. He, kn- he knew how to, I was here before, I've done this before, right? I can do this. How many of you tell your teenagers, uh, I've been you, you've never been me? Amen? That, that's the edge I have, right? I don't have the edge of style and music and everything, but the edge I do have is life experience, right? But it's strength and wisdom. And so we put those two together. And so it's, it's the wisdom of the older, but it's what I like to call the wonder of the younger. You've got to have both. You've got to have the strength and the wisdom in the, in the church moving. You've got to have both of it. I love what young people bring to the table, they're, they're, they bring zeal, excitement, passion. They've got the craziest ideas. If it was up to the young people, we would have a water slide in the church. We would have this, we'd have that. they got crazy ideas, right? But like I said last week, young people have a lot of zeal but no money, right? So they, they have all these dreams, but how are you going to get there? Well, I don't know, right? I guess my dad's going to pay for it, right? Yeah, Amen. But see, what adults have that youth don't? What do the adults have that, or older people have, the older generation that youth don't? Well, they have life experience. That alone right there. You don't, you know, one of the things as a dad, you don't have to, you know, know the style of music and style of clothes and be in touch with all that and be up on all that. But you share life experiences. That's what makes you so unique and so powerful in the life of your child. The life experiences. Come on, somebody. Amen. So we have li- the life experience. Their perspective is different, isn't it? As a, an adult, it just gets different, doesn't it? It's like, wow. Amen. How many remember wherever you grew up as a kid when you were little? I remember the living room. How many thought your backyard was huge? How many ever went back years later like, what? I can't even run around in here. <laughs> like, you know, I have to go outside the yard and change my mind. It's so small, right? So you just, right? It's like, why? Because your perspective changes. You have a different perspective on it, right? So that's what you, adults have that youth don't. They have resources that young people don't. They're able to get resources, and they have opportunity that young people don't have. They do have opportunity. You think, well, young people have more opportunity. No, they don't. Older people have more opportunity. Think about it. But what do young people have the, that the adults don't have? Well, they have time. <laughs> they have more time, right, don't they? They have it in that innocence. There's an innocence, and the view of a child is different than the view of an adult. There's an innocence there, right? You ever ask your child about something, and it's just like, okay, I guess that could happen, but not in this world. Why? Because they just see things different. They're innocent about things, right? And, you know, they just see things. that There's that innocence, but there's that zeal and that passion that, that they have, and then there's that connection. They're connected to their generation. They know what's going on. They, they know those things. I mean, as an adult, I'm just like, hey, uh, Kind of fill me in. Is this word okay? 
oh, dad, don't ever say that word in public. How many know what I'm talking about? Don't ever say that in public. Like, dad, the dance, don't do that again. Like, no. It's not even, it doesn't even work on TikTok anymore, right? So, amen. Let me move for this quickly. The older generation imparts. That's what we do. We impart. We trust. We have to trust, you know, uh, the younger generation. We give uh, confidence to them. Paul told Timothy, I am confident that the same faith that was in your grandmother and your mother, it's in you. If young people don't sense that confidence from their parents, from the older generation, they will expect failure. They will live up to the standard of failure if they don't know we trust them. Come on, somebody. And support. So older generation gives support. We support. We cheerlead. We, we, you know, we, we kind of cheer them on. We give that support. The younger generation learns. That's what they need to do. They learn. They honor. And then they build. And so we as adults, we, uh, you know, they honor, we respect. Come on, that's, that's a two-way street, isn't it? The Bible says that the older, I mean the younger, you've got to respect and, and submit to the older. That's what the Bible says. But then he goes on to say this, let every one of you submit to one another. Why? Because there's strength that you have that I don't. And I need to yield to that and submit to that. And then we can kind of work together. Anybody? I need to move quickly. The, the challenges of each generation. Well, I've, I just said old and young, so forgive me if I offend anybody. But for the older generation, younger generation, that's what I'm referring, there's a fear in both generations. There's, there's a fear in the older generation that they'll be useless and no more need for them. I'll be pushed to the side and forgotten. The younger generation has the fear of being useless and no need at all. We just don't need them. We don't want to hear from them. Come on, somebody. And there's that old, old, older generation has the fear, I'm going to lose what I have or what I created or what I worked for. And the younger generation fears that I won't have anything at all. Think about it. The younger generation says, move behind us. The younger generation says, move aside. <laughs> I mean, no, that's, that's a challenge, isn't it, in our generation? And the older uh, generation, their challenges, they, they deal sometimes with stubbornness. All the adults are like, no, I don't. I, re I refuse to say I do. Amen. But you do. We, that's our, just what we deal with. The older you get, you, and the, but the younger deals with pride. They've got to deal with that pride and exaltation and and come on, right? And the older generation has to let go. The younger generation has to take hold. The older generation gives. The younger has to receive. Amen? That's just the way it works, isn't it? First Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. He told, talked to Timothy, who wasn't uh, a teenager, but he was a young. We would consider him young, younger man. He said this, let no one look down on you because of your youth. Be an example, rather, set an example or be a pattern for the believers. Isn't that amazing? How many know that's a responsibility of the younger generation? Be that pattern. Be that ideal model for all believers. And here, but here's the point. The natural tendency is to look down on young people, young leaders, and young ideas. How many know that there's a tendency in all of us to do that? We want to look down on people. He said that's just, you're going to face that. You're going to come into this, this town, and there's going to be the older council. There's going to be this older council, of Jew, Jewish council. They're all older men. And he said, but don't let anybody look down on you because you're young. You're just as called as they are. You're anointed. God's moving in your life. Amen? Come on, somebody. So that tendency for us is to look down on young people, young leaders, and young ideas. How many uh, adults ever caught yourself uh, blaming uh, everything on young people when young people are just following the adults? It's just like we, we tend to blame young people for all the, there's new ideas in the church, new doctrines going on. Well, what about the older people that are allowing it to happen? Look at all the problems going on. Well, what about the older people that are passing laws and bills and making that okay? Anybody? All right. Got to move on. And, and so we've gotta, we have these challenges. The challenge would be there's no place for the youth, and the challenge is there's no tolerance for adults. That's our challenge, isn't it? And the third thing and last thing I need to hurry and just leave you with today on this part is really keeping the church moving is going. All of us have to go together. Jesus said all of us have to go together. Come on somebody, amen. We are, we are not a consumer church. We are a commissioning church. That's our heart. How many know if you entertain people, entertain young people, you're just going to produce consumers. That's all you're going to produce in the church. 
They're not happy because you don't have the lights, the smoke, the music, the, the expense of this and this and this and this and this. And you don't have all the amenities and you don't have all this stuff. And I'm just a consumer Christian. What can you get from, give to me? What can I get out of the church? What can I get out of this, 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 right? That's a consumer mentality. How many know God hasn't called us to be consumers in the church but servants, right? We're here to serve. We're not here to consume. But if we're not careful, amen, we'll, get, we'll, we'll kind of lose sight of the commission. We'll lose sight of the, the, the going in, in, in the church. We'll lose sight of that. We'll talk about it, but it's really a side issue. We'll appoint somebody, an outreach director, but it's really not the focus. How I many know that it's got to be about going, doesn't it? Anybody? Come on. You can say amen. I'm almost done. I mean, it's got to be about going, isn't it? Right? So it's that commissioning church. We're not a consumer church. See, Christianity is not a consumer religion. It's a producer of faith. That's what it does. It's supposed to produce faith in God in you and not an attitude that what can I get from God? Amen? Right? And so the church is not to be an amusement center. It's to be a training center. It's not to be a shopping center. It's to be a giving center. It's not to be a nursery. It's to be a gym. It's not to be a, a cruise ship. It's to be a battleship. It's not to be a fancy restaurant. It's to be a cafeteria for workers. Amen. There's not anything in the church that is designed to make us feel comfortable and, and, and good about ourselves, but everything to put us to work, to work together. Come on, somebody. Amen. To really build our faith in the Lord so that we can continue in the mission of Jesus Christ. That's why the Holy Ghost is given. The Holy Ghost wasn't given for you to run around the church and feel goosebumps and to prophesy about who's going to be in the next president. Those things are good and they feel great, but that's not where the Holy Ghost came. I just lost a bunch of people on that one. Anyways, the Holy Ghost has come so that we can build the church, edify the body, and do the mission of Jesus Christ. In fact, the Holy Ghost came so that we could fulfill the mission, keep the mission going that Jesus started, that we would finish the work that Jesus started. That's why the Holy Ghost came. Can anybody say amen? And so the mission of Jesus, that mission of Jesus will explode. When we work together, when we come together and we realize, wow, we've got to come together as a generational church and not just say that, that and put that on our website, we're a generational church, but to act like it, to really be that generational church and work together. Why? Because the mission of Jesus explodes in a church that's going together. Amen. You believe that with all your heart? I do. How many want to see a church that's moving? I want to be a part of this church that's moving. I want to be a part of the church. And how many believe that time that we really kind of... Uh, we're sowing more into this generation so that we can be growing, so that we can ultimately be going. How many believe that? Amen. Do you believe that this morning? Can you stand on your feet? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So we're not just passing down stories or information, but it's covenant, it's legacy, it's faith. And this is why it's so important that we do become a generational church, that we walk in the purposes of God together and building a generational church church. I don't know about you. I'm just going to be a little transparent. There's times I act, still have nightmares. You know, you get, you get to be older. They're just a little different. You know, uh, when you're a kid, you have nightmares of the boogeyman coming out of the closet, right? When you're older, you have nightmares of the bank coming to get your house. You know, I mean, just they're different, but they're the same. You know, you, you get all crazy about it. You know, someone repossessing your vehicle that you can't even afford. But anyways, and, and, there's different, and you have these nightmares. And as a pastor, I, I got to be honest, I've had sometimes the nightmares that like, man, Someday we're just going to have to close our doors because, like, you know, there's going to be old people, no young people. We're not reaching anybody. And, and like, I stress out about how can we do this better and do this, and, and we should be doing this, right? And, and let's reach this city for the Lord. Amen? That's just where I struggle. Amen? I wake up, my wife's got to be like, okay, have a cup of coffee, come back down. Everything's good. You're good. This is great. Amen? Talk to the leaders. Good. You're great. We're doing right. Okay. And they help me, right? Anyways, why? Because I feel like it's just a drive that the Lord has put in my spirit to see this generation impact the next generation and the next generation impact the next generation. Amen? Why? Because we got to go from generation to generation. How many believe that? Amen? Do you believe that? Can we put our hands together and say, God, we're going to do our part. Amen? And so we have to ask ourselves as a church, we ask ourselves, are we reaching this generation this present generation so that we can reach the next generation? With my kids, am I really reaching my kids and developing my kids and training them and teaching them? Am I just wanting them to be quiet because I'm trying to watch a game? Or am I just trying to get through life? Or am I, am I, am I dragging my kids everywhere or am I leading my kids? You know, these are questions that we ask ourselves. Is it, 
in the heart of our church to be a generational church, to see the next generation come up, to see the next generation, amen, come into the call of God and, and, and chase after the glory of God and the purpose of God and be touched by the power of God like we were, amen. That's got to be our heart, doesn't it? And we, want, we don't want to be like the church in the wilderness where we're constantly complaining about what was and wish we could go back and we're not moving forward. We want to be the church of the book of Acts where we can't stop growing. We can't help but grow because it's just the passion of the Lord and the, the mission of Jesus and seeing people saved and moving on this generation. I don't know about you, but I'm so uh, encouraged lately to say that God is moving in this generation. I say God is moving in this generation right now. In this generation, God is moving. Some of you look at, don't watch TV. Don't base it on TV. You can't do that. Don't base it on uh, what you're hearing and, and seeing in the culture. You've got to base it on what God is seeing. Through the portals of time, looking down through that covenant. Amen. I've made a covenant with Abraham. I'm still making a covenant with you. Amen. That I'm raising up a generation that's going to worship me. And they're going to be abandoned for me and run after my purpose and fulfill the call of God. And be the ministers in the earth that I'm calling today. I believe. God's moving in this generation. How many believe that? Amen. But how many can raise your hand to heaven and say, as a member of River Valley Church or even a visitor today, a guest with us today, I want to see God move in greater ways today, right now. I want to see God's glory move. I want to see God do what he did for me, for my neighbors, for my family. God saved me and touched me in such an amazing way. I want to see that so much. God, so the question is, what can I do? What can I do right now? Amen, to be a part of this generational church. What can I do? Can I pray? Can I give? Can I reach out? Can I invite? Can I just, maybe there's a family member, a, a, a niece or a nephew, or maybe there's a grandchild or somebody, Lord, help me play my part, do my part, amen, in this generation, to reach this generation, amen, for you, in Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Hey, everyone, this is Anthony. Thank you for joining us at River Valley Church. It's our hope and prayer that this message blesses and encourages you in your walk with Jesus. If it's done that today, we ask that you like this message and subscribe to the channel. Also, don't forget to click that bell icon so that you don't miss out on any new content that's posted. If God's place is on your heart to give today, there's a link in the description where you can get all of that information. We ask that you also follow our social channels here at River Valley Church so that you can stay connected with everything that's happening here at the church and also in our community. Most importantly, if you need prayer, we ask that you click on the next step section of our website where you'll find a prayer request form and you can fill out as much or as little as you want. But we've got some awesome men and women who are ready to stand with you in your time of need. That's all for today. Thank you again for joining us at River Valley Church. Have a great week. God bless.